on preach our own seeds. Yeah. And so turn to Genesis 8.22, but it's not about giving. There's a lot of different seeds besides the giving seed and so on, the financial seed. But talk about the seed of the Word of God. Now a small acre can grow to be a giant tree, and all of the qualities of the plants we see are found in a seed. And so every seed is really just a data bank. And in, in that seed uh, contains the information of what that plant is going to be. And so seeds will determine the size of the plant and the type of fruit that it will bear. And so God established seed time and harvest. Genesis 8, 22 says, While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. And so God established the law of seed time and harvest, and, and it's a law that we see in nature, but also it's a law spiritually. And so we know in the natural world that Pine trees produce pine trees, and, and apple trees produce apple trees, and, and people produce people, and animals produce animals, and fish produce fish. And so that is the natural law, but also in the spiritual, what we plant spiritually will produce a spiritual harvest in our life. One man brought sin into the world, and because of that, everyone is born into sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Amen? But one man brought righteousness into the world, and because of Jesus Christ, we can all be right with God. Amen? And so, the word of God is a seed. And so, the book of 1 Peter calls it an incorruptible seed. Come on, it's a seed that can never fail. It's a seed that will always produce a harvest whenever it's planted in a willing heart. And so, the word of God contains the seeds of, of everything that you need in your life. It contains a seed of salvation, a seed of righteousness, a seed of eternal life, a seed of divine healing. Come on, a, a seed of peace with God, a seed of finances. The Bible has a seed for everything that you need in your life. Now turn to, to Mark 4 and verse 14. And so Jesus told the, the parable of the sower. And so the sower went forth and he, he sowed some seed and, and some of it fell by the wayside and and so it gets eaten by the birds, and some of the seed fell on stony ground, and so it never developed a root, and, and the plant uh, didn't last. And then some of the feet, seed fell on, on thorny ground, and, and so whenever it grew up, the thorns and the weeds choked that plant. But then some of the seed falls on good ground. And so in uh, Mark chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, The sower soweth the seed, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they likewise, which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word immediately, receive it with gladness, and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution arises, for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things, enter it in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. And these are they which are sown on good ground, such as hear the word, and receive it, and bring forth fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixtyfold, and some a hundredfold. And so there's the seed is sown, the seed is the word, but it falls on four different types of ground. And so the ground represents the hearts of people and the hearts of men. But only, only one type of ground was good soil that produced the harvest. I don't know about you, but I want to be good ground. Amen? Amen. Whenever I hear the word, I want it to produce a harvest in my life. Amen. I don't want to just come and, you know, and, and hear ministry come to camp meeting and, and you know, and, and sit in all those services and be ministered to, yet it never produced anything in my life. But the point of the word is the point of, is to plant a seed so that change will come in my life. Amen? And I'll become fruitful for the kingdom of God. Now the first type of ground that didn't produce fruit was wayside ground. And when it's talking about the wayside, it's really talking about the walking path that, that is in the fields. And so people would walk on this path and, and they would uh, press down the dirt so that it was very hard. And whenever the seed fell on the dirt, it would not penetrate. It could not be planted. And so wayside ground represents people with a hard heart. And whenever they receive the word of God, 
it really doesn't enter in and produce a harvest because they never act on the word. Amen? And so you don't have to be a, a mean person to have a hard heart. And we think of somebody with a hard heart as, you know, maybe being mean or cold or, or something like that. But you can be in church every Sunday and still have a hard heart. In other words, you hear the word of God, but you never do it. Come on, it never produces a harvest in your life. Come on, and you hear sermon after sermon, and, and you go home and you think, oh man, that was a good word, but you never put it into practice. Amen? And actually, you know, growing up in church, you can develop an immunity to the Word of God. In other words, you've heard it so much, and, and you've rebelled against it so much that it's almost like you're immune to the gospel. Amen? I know growing up, you know, at one point when I was a teenager, I kind of decided, you know, I want to have some fun, and, and I don't want to live for God, at least not at this period of my life, and, and maybe later on when I'm older, and, and I've, you know, gone through college and high school, and and, uh, you know, and, and all those fun times have passed. At that point, I'll live for God. And so what I didn't realize is that sin is addictive. Yeah. And a lot of folks say, well, you know, I'm going to put this off till I'll put off serving God to, to some other time. But what I've seen in people's <laughs> lives is that they get entrapped in sin in the lifestyle. And then they're not able to break out except for the grace of God. Thank God that I had praying parents and and parents who believed in faith, so that I was able to change, was able to break out. But you know, I said in service after service, and in our home, it was a requirement to go to church. You know, our family, they didn't say like, it was not even an option that you weren't going to go to church, unless you were in the hospital or something like that. You know, then you probably wouldn't have to go. But if you said I was sick, they said, you know, we're going to have a healing service. So... You can go ahead and come to church because you're going to get healed. Or you say, oh, I'm tired. Well, you know, the Holy Spirit will liven you up. He will quicken your mortal body and give life to your mortal body. There were no excuses. And back then, you know, it was three times a week. And so I was there in body. But in mind, I wasn't always there. Can some of you relate? Because you can sit in the church and, and really not hear the Word of God. Or you can hear it and have predetermined in your heart that you're not going to obey and you're not going to do it. And really you develop an immunity to it. You're just kind of going through the motions. You're like a man whose wife makes him go to church. And he's there just to keep peace in the family. Come on, I've lived that before too. Come on, I used to, I used to get high before I went to church. And that's really bad, amen? And uh, that wasn't just a couple weeks ago. But uh, years ago, we, I had to go to church, right? I'd get up, go take a ride, smoke a joint, come back, take a shower, whatever, and we'd go to church. And i just kind of sit through the church service and, and really, you know, not really pay much attention. And I certainly wasn't going to change. I already had my beer iced down for that afternoon, and I had no plans of changing. But one day, something got a hold on me. Amen. One day I was sitting in the worship service and the Spirit of God touched me and renewed something in my heart and changes began to come and I began to want to, to make changes. Amen? And so the Spirit of God can break a hard heart. But a hard heart is a, is a bad thing. And some, some folks think, well, I'm self-sufficient. Come on, I don't really need God. And some people say, well, I'm a self-made man. And I ask him, well, why did you make yourself so ugly then? I mean, uh, I'm self-made. You know, and, and because many times the hard heart is, is because of pride. And people say, you know, I'll make it on my own, and I really don't need any help. And even to the point that they don't think that they need God, that they're self-sufficient. And, and others just say, well, you know, I'm going to put it off to another time. You know, at some other point, at some point in the future, I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to live for God and, and start going to church. And they promise themselves that just like they promise to go on a diet every Monday. But it seems like something always comes up and interrupts that diet. Amen? Too many good opportunities. And we've always found out that we can put that diet off until tomorrow. Have you ever noticed how easy that is to do? But some people do that with God. They just put him on the shelf and say... Well, at some time in the future, I'm going to live for God. 
Come on, but the longer you wait, the harder it is. Come on, the more chance the devil has to, to put roots on you, put a grip on you, and the harder it is for you to change. Amen? Amen? And so the Bible says, today is a day of salvation. Amen. Come on, one of the devil's biggest tricks is just, you know, procrastination. Put it off. You know, you can do that next year. You can do that later or whatever. But no, you need to make the decision today. No matter what, whenever I rededicated my life, I had a case of ice down beer in the ice box. I went home and I threw it in the dumpster. Amen. And my wife knew I was serious. Because a lot of people say, well, I'm going to drink the beer first, and then I'm going to rededicate my life to Christ. When you decide that it's ready, you got to, come on, you got to, you got to move when God's moving on you. Come on, there's a time and there's a place for you to make a decision. Come on, there's a time and a place, and you may well, you may as well decide it. I'm going to do it right now. Yeah. Come on, the Bible talks about the deceitfulness of sin. People get deceived. Come on, they never intended to, you know, backslide for 50 years or, or you know, end up in the things that they ended up in. But they were, they were deceived by the devil, deceived by sin. And so a hard heart will cause you just to sit in church and, and not ever move, not ever act on anything. Because you already made up your mind that, that I'm going to do what I want to do. Yeah. You know, and, and one of these days, I'm going to get it right. Yeah. You know, hopefully on my deathbed, when I can't have any fun anymore, then, then you know, I'm going to get right with God. That's, you know, that's what many people think about. But the Bible talks about Pharaoh when he refused to let the children of Israel go. And he hardened his heart. And so, so God began to, to send a systematic trouble to his life. And first of all, God sent the frogs, and, and Pharaoh still wouldn't let him go. And then God sent lice, and, uh, and so Pharaoh, you know, he wasn't moved by the lice. And, and then uh, God sent sickness, and he wasn't moved by the sickness. And, and so he continued to harden his heart, and then finally God killed his firstborn son. And then Pharaoh decided to obey. And you know, we can either listen to the word and be corrected by the word, or we can be corrected by trouble in the situation of life. It's not that God does evil to you. It's just that when you're not living for him, he withdraws his protection. And in some cases, God lets things happen to you so that, or he's hoping that you wake up. And you see that, hey, things aren't going well in my life. I need to serve God. I need to turn my life over to him. And so it happens just, just a little bit at a time. And God has a lot of different ways of speaking to us. But when trouble comes to your life and, and you're not in the place that you need to be with God, the first thing you need to do is examine your life and your relationship with God. Am I obedient to God? Come on, am I doing everything that I'm supposed to be doing? How is my walk? How is my relationship with God? Come on, and so when you get close to God, or and God, you know, will let things happen to you, so that you'll decide to make a move and, and, and get in his will and get in his purpose for your life. Yeah. Amen. And so God has a way of, of breaking hard hearts. Right. You know, when you see things going wrong, come on, you ought to wake up and say, hey, I need to make a change. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, I need to live for God. That's what I did in my life, you know. And, and even in the short few years I spent in sin, I began to see destruction coming and, and bad things happening to me. And things that, you know, I wish I'd never been involved in. Things I wish I'd never done. Yeah. Come on and thank God that I was able to, to wake up and yeah. change. Amen? Yeah. Then the second type of soil is stony ground. And stony ground is just shallow soil. And so it's just got a thin layer of topsoil and then there's rocks underneath it. When I lived in Fort Worth many years ago, I decided I wanted to have a, a garden in the backyard. And so I went out in the backyard and then there was some rich dirt there. But, you know, when you dug down, there was maybe an inch or two of, of topsoil, and underneath that was rock. So I had to get out there, you know, with a shovel and a pickaxe and, and break up all that rock so that I could have a garden and so that the plants could develop roots. And so in stony ground, the, the soil is so shallow that the plants never really develop a root system. Yeah. And so when it gets hot, come on, and when it gets dry, then the plants wither and they die. And so stony ground people are folks who, who never develop spiritual roots. Mm -hmm. Come on, they lack the fruit of faithfulness in their life. Yeah. And the Bible says they even receive the word with gladness. Yeah. Come on, they don't rebel against the word. They don't say, I'm not going to do that. They have the best of intentions. Yeah. 
but they lack spiritual roots. And, and so they don't, you know, they never stay in, in church long enough to really be established and, and begin to serve and begin to mature spiritually. They don't have a personal relationship with God outside of church. Come on, where they feed on the Word of God, or they read Christian books, or you know, listen to preaching on TV, or listen to CDs, and and have a prayer time and worship God. They don't have anything that will sustain spiritual life, right. and because of that, they don't have any strength. Mm -hmm. Jesus said that He was the vine, we're the branches. Yeah. We draw everything from Him, yeah. and all spiritual life we have, we've drawn from Him. Yeah. Come on, in our connection with Jesus. Is the time that we spend with Him. Yes. Come on, the time that we spend worshiping together at church, the time we spend studying His Word, the time that we spend in worship and prayer by ourselves, that is our connection to Him. That is our spiritual, our spiritual strength. Yes. And without that, we've got no spiritual strength. Yes. Amen. And so the Bible says with stony ground people that Satan comes and he steals the Word. Yes. It says whenever persecution and affliction comes... Come on, they wither up and they die because they don't have a spiritual root system. Right. Come on, they have no way to sustain themselves spiritually. And, and because they never develop roots, come on, they never really grow spiritually. They're the folks that come and shout at camp meeting and be so enthused and really be on fire for God for a week or two. Come on, then you don't see them in church for a month or two. And you wonder what happened. Come on, because they lack the fruit of faithfulness in their life. Let me tell you, the Christian life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah. Come on, it's not a one-month deal. It's not a one-year deal. It's not a five-year deal. It is a, an eternal deal. Yeah. Come on, it's a lifetime and then eternity. Yeah. But you have to have the fruit of faithfulness that you're going to stay established. You're going to stay rooted in God no matter what comes your way. Because I guarantee you, whenever you make a commitment for God, the devil's going to try to stop you. Come on, you won't live for God unopposed because you have an enemy. Come on, and your enemy is smart. And so he has plans and he lays traps so that he can stop you and stop you from fulfilling the will of God for your life. Amen? But if you're rooted in Christ, come on, and you have a spiritual support, support system... He can't stop you. Amen? Amen. Amen? And so, so many things are prevented by prayer. I found that whenever I pray and whenever I worship God, that God is watching out for my back. Amen? Amen. And if there's some trouble coming up, God can warn me. Come on, and He can protect me, and He can keep me. Amen? Because I have a spiritual root system. And so, stony ground folks, they, you know, they receive the word with gladness. Come on, and then also it says... When persecution comes, they're offended. Yeah. And so sometimes stony ground people are easily offended. And that's one of the devil's biggest traps, isn't it? Yeah. Try to get me, okay. come on, out of, you know, out of whack with somebody else. And, yeah. and uh, or out of sync with somebody else. And, and, you know, offense can come for so many different reasons. The pastor recognized somebody else. He didn't recognize me. Somebody didn't yeah. shake my hand. Okay. Uh, you know? Uh, whatever it may be, I didn't get invited to that party or, or this party or, you know, whatever it may be, folks can easily get offended. No. Come on, and when you get offended, you lose. And the people you're offended at, they don't know, they don't care. They couldn't give a flip. Come on, but you lose out in your relationship with God, and the devil has found a way to steal your love, your joy, and your peace, and your happiness. Amen. All because of an, a, a situation. Amen. And so... We have to develop spiritual roots. You've got to have a character of faithfulness in your life. Come on, when you get up on Sunday morning, you don't flip a coin to see if you're going to church or not. Come on. You establish a daily time with God. Come on, and you, you don't miss it. You know, I, I miss it occasionally. You know, I'll take a day off. But, but you don't miss it the vast majority of the time because you know that is what sustains you spiritually. Come on, that is your spiritual life. That you've got, that you that when you draw from God, amen, and you do it at church. I was so blessed by the, the camp meeting services and was ministered to. And, and, you know, I was able to buy some books and CDs and, and take them home so that what I received will continue in the next few months. And, and I'll continue to be fed spiritually, but was blessed. And I found that, that ministries add a different, each ministry adds a different aspect to my spiritual life. 
I learned some things from, from Guy Pei and from reading his books this past week that, that I really didn't know before. And other things maybe I knew that I had forgotten. But I believe it was the divine connection that was, he was here. Just if it was for nobody else, it was for me. Yeah. Amen. So that I could be fed spiritually. Yeah. Amen. Oh, yeah. And the third type of soil is, is thorny ground people. <laughs> And thorny ground people, they're not just antagonistic people. Come on, they're people with the wrong priorities. Come on, it says the thorns grew up and they choked the plant. And so thorny ground people are people who let other things choke the word of God in their life. Come on, and they let the cares of this life choke the word of God. Now, you know, I've heard it preached before that the cares of this life are, are worries about life. But really, that's not what it means. The cares of this life are just the non-spiritual things that we have to do. Yeah. Come on, they're just the personal business of life. Yeah. Come on, there's things that, that you have to do to live. Come on, you have to make a living. You have to work. You have to, gotta, you have to pay your bills and manage your finances. You've got to spend time with your family. Yeah. You know, you've got to mow the yard. You've got to take care of your car. There's, there's a lot of personal business and personal things that you have to do and that we all have to do. But thorny ground people are folks who spend all their time on their personal business and their personal things, and they invest no time in their spiritual life. Come on, they just let all the other things choke out their spiritual life. Come on, it says the desire for other things, and it doesn't necessarily mean sinful things. But you can get involved in so many things that will cause you to lose your spiritual focus. And they can be good things. Come on, good activities, healthy activities. They can be good things. But if they're robbing your, your time with God and they're robbing your spiritual life, you're not going to benefit in the long run. Yeah. Amen. We all have to exercise or we all should exercise. Yeah. Come on, we all should go on a date with our wife. We should all pay our bills. And how many know that takes a little bit of time? Yeah. You know, to manage your finances and pay your bills. And, and all those things take time. Yet God has to be the priority in our life. Amen. Come on, we have to put him first. And I found out whenever I put him first that all those other things take care of themselves. Yes. Amen. I mean, I still have to work and, and do those things. But I found out that those things all fall into order whenever I put God first in my life. Amen. Amen. And so it talks about the things that, that choke the word. It says the deceitfulness of riches. Come on, in other words, uh, an unhealthy desire for money. And so money is a good thing. Ambition is a good thing. And God doesn't mind if you have money or if you have a lot of it as long as he's first. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And as long as you don't uh, forsake him and, and your relationship with him or compromise your relationship with him to get money. Amen? Amen. But God has ordained work. And, you know, it tells us to invest and save. And, and God wants us to have an abundance. How many know that poor people don't support missions and, you know, support the church and all those? I mean, they do on a smaller scale. But obviously, you know, God wants you to be blessed so that you can be a blessing to other people. And you can't do that if you're broke. But everything is in balance. Amen? You could have such a desire for finances that you neglect your relationship with God. And some folks, come on, some folks do that. I remember a few years ago, I got into a, a day trading, stock trading program. And uh, so somebody had bought this program for me, and, and so it was, uh, it was being a day trader. And so it had software that went with it, and you'd, you'd watch the stock market, and then, uh, you know, you'd buy these particular stocks, and you'd watch these graphs, and, and you'd, you know, it talks you about the different angles of the graphs and how they went up. And, and so when you saw that, that stock going up at a certain angle, then you'd buy it. And then when it started going down on the graph, and you sell it. It was a pretty cool thing. And so I started, I started playing that, and, and uh, I started thinking, wow, this is cool. And, and one time, and we were doing it with play money. You start out with play money. And that's a good thing while you're learning to do it. <laughs> but one day I bought a stock, and I made $25,000. I was like, whoa, man. And, uh, and so, you know, the stock market was going up a lot then. And so I, you know... I started playing it, and you know, some days, 2000 5000 whatever, and, and I was just playing with $200,000 capital. And so I started thinking, man, I can make a living off of this. 
and I could even leave the ministry. I, you know, and with the kind of profits that I was making, you know, with $200,000 capital, I could easily make 100000 a year or even 200000 a year. But, you know, I found out that it was, that was so when the stock market was going up. No. But when it quit going up and when the market was flat, then you couldn't make anything. But anyway, the point is, it became an obsession with me. And it became a God in my life. And I got to the point that, you know, I wasn't, you know, I quit praying. And I prayed a little bit. But, you know, God didn't have my heart. And that thing became such a distraction. I have to eat before you eat. And if I don't eat spiritually, then you don't eat spiritually. Amen? Amen. But it got out of whack. Amen? And, and so the priorities and the motives got wrong. And I'm not saying that that's true for everybody. Maybe some folks could keep it in perspective. But, but for me, it got my life out of priority, and I had to cut it off. Amen? Amen. And so, that can, you know, that can happen in people's lives. But God doesn't want everything. He just wants the first, and he wants the best. Yeah. Amen? The tithe is the first. Yeah. Come on, Sunday is the first day of the week. Come on, I try to spend the first part of my day talking with God and fellowshipping with Him. Amen? We don't give God everything, but we give Him the first and we give Him the best. We make Him priority in our life. And I dare say, if other things are robbing your relationship with God, you need to cut them off. Right. Because in eternity, how, how important will it be that you spent two or three hours on the internet reading news and playing around on Facebook or whatever? It's not going to be very important. Come on, or that you did, you know, all these other things. And so we have to ask ourselves, what matters in eternity? Yeah. Amen. And so we keep money in its proper place by honoring God with a tithe and making sure that God has our heart. Amen. Yeah. But the fourth type of soil was good ground. Amen. And so the, the soil that fell on good ground was received, it was planted, and it produced a 30, a 60, and a 100-fold return. Amen? A 100-fold harvest. And, and it's great as a pastor to see that happen in people's lives. Yeah. That they receive the Word of God. Come on, and they don't just stay stagnant or stay at the same place spiritually, yeah. but they grow spiritually. Yeah. Come on, the Word went into good ground. Yeah. And it began to produce a harvest. I, yeah. I think of, of Will Barnett and Buddy Nellis' son and... And I remember when Will came back to church, I believe it was in 2006, and, and came back, and he'd been in the world and been on drugs and, and had a hard life, but he came back and rededicated his life to God. And, and so he was in, in church for several years before he went to, to IHOP and began to pursue ministry. But I saw, I saw a zeal in Will's life, and, and now, you know, he's getting ready to go to Thailand this summer. I believe he's going to be here this spring. But, but, you know, in eight years, he went from, you know, of being a backslider to being a missionary in eight years. I mean, it was a long process. And to some of you, eight years is a, you know, a long period of time. But to somebody my age, it doesn't seem like that long of a period of time. No. But the Word of God fell on good ground. And it produced a harvest. I can think of, you know, Ralph Hagemeyer, who preaches here about once a year. You know, and was saved in this church as a teenager, called to missions. And and, you know, it was just a small church back then, but, but Ralph, you know, went to Africa. Now, you know, many years later, they've got a school that ministers the, the hundreds of, hundreds of, teaches hundreds of children in a, a Bible school that, that trains up pastors. And, and you think of all the people who have been saved. Amen? Yeah. All the people have come into the kingdom of God just because one person took the word of God and they applied it. Yeah. Come on, it fell on good ground. Come on, do you want to be good ground? Yeah. At the end of your life, to, will there be a harvest because of, of your belief in the Word of God and how you've applied it? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Or is it just going to fall on deaf ears and not have any effect in your life, not bring any change? Come on, not produce anything for the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be good ground. Amen? Yeah. That the Word of God changes me and helps me to change other people's lives. And if the Word doesn't change you, it's probably not going to ch change anybody else. Amen? Yeah. But it's got to change you. But the Word of God is a seed that has the power to change every aspect in every area of your life. But the seed of the Word's got, the seed of the Word has got to be planted in your heart. And what is planted brings a harvest in our life. Paul said that he planted 
Apollos watered, but that God gave the increase. Amen. Amen. And some folks plant. Some, some folks come along and water. But it's God who brings the supernatural increase to our life. And so the Word will make a difference in your life. Come on, what you plan and what you receive gladly and what you put into practice will bring a spiritual harvest in your life. And so seeds are powerful things. Come on, a seed will grow through a rock or it'll grow through a parking lot. And I know that well because I'm always spraying weeds around here where the seeds are growing up through rock, you know, concrete and, and uh, growing up through rock. And, and you know, they're, they're hard to stop. Seeds in the natural are powerful things. But how many know the Word of God is a powerful seed? The Bible says it's an incorruptible seed. In other words, it's guaranteed. It will never fail. Come on, and if I receive it, if I plant it, if I act on it, it's going to bring a harvest in my life. Amen. But you know, planting seeds is not very exciting. And I'm a, you know, I'm a gardener, maybe not a real good gardener. <laughs> but but uh, I try, anyway. And, uh, and so, the, you know, the, the worst part of gardening is the planting. That's the hardest part, preparing the soil. And then, you know, sometimes I'm down there on my hands and knees planting tomato plants. And, and you know, digging in the ground, and getting dirty and muddy and, and, uh, and all of that. It's not real exciting. Come on, and other times I'll plant seeds. You know, you dig a little hole and, and you drop the seed in, you cover it up, and, and then you water it, and then you wait. It's not real exciting. And sometimes when you're planting the Word of God, it may seem, not seem like it's real exciting. Come on, when you're memorizing a scripture, or you're, you're confessing a scripture, amen, you're applying the, the scripture, it may not seem real exciting. Yeah. Come on, but one day the harvest will come. Yeah. And I guarantee you, the harvest never looks like the seed. Come on. And the Bible is the Word of God in seed form. Amen? Amen. And so if I, you know, in the natural, if I want tomatoes, I got to plant tomatoes. And you know, if I want beans, I got to plant beans. That's true in the natural, but in the spiritual, it's also true. If I want a certain type of spiritual harvest, I got to, I got to plant that type of spiritual seed in my life. Amen. Come on. If I, if I need peace in life and peace of mind, come on, I've got to plant some faith seeds in my heart. Come on, some promises of God in my heart, of, of God's protection and, and God taking care of me and, and God providing for me. Amen. I've got to plant those kind of seeds in my life. If I want divine protection and, you know, I'm in fear for my safety, what I do, I plant some 91st Psalm. Amen. I plant some of that in my life, that, that God will protect me and God will keep me. Come on, if I want confidence, I plant seeds of who I am in Christ. And what God is to me. And the fact that God is my helper. Come on, that, that God is my shield. God is my fortress. I plant those kinds of seeds. And so what do you want in your life? You need to plant those kinds of seeds in your heart. Come on, plant pr the promises of God in your heart. And they'll bring a, a harvest in your life. A harvest in your mind. A harvest in your finances. A harvest in every area of your life. And so some, sometimes folks are, are healed miraculously and immediately. You know, we saw some of that in camp meeting. And some folks have, you know, that type of ministry and, and miracles happen. But, you know, many times we have to plant a seed to get a miracle. Amen. And it doesn't happen spectac spectacularly. And one of the reasons is, is because God expects us to grow up spiritually. Yeah. Right. Amen? Amen? And so after a while, God requires you to develop your faith. And exercise your faith. And so he does that so that you can mature spiritually. Amen. So that you won't always be dependent upon somebody's miracle ministry. Yeah. Come on, that you won't always be dependent upon that. But you learn to exercise your faith. And, and when you face challenges in life, yeah. come on, God wants you to exercise your faith. To get in the word of God so that you can stand and so that you can grow up. Come on, when, when, when kids are little and when they're babies, you do everything for them. But after a period of time, you, you make them start doing things for themselves. Yeah. Where my mama used to tie my shoelaces. But at some point, she made me tie myself. You know, and I don't know if I was 12 or 13 or whatever. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I had the hardest time tying my shoes. But, you know, whatever age it was, when I had to tie my own shoes. And, and uh, you know, I had to start doing things for myself. 
Amen. The same thing is true. God loves you, but he loves you enough to let you grow up. Amen. Come on, to let you take on some responsibility. Amen. And it's really, it's really cute to see a little kid with a, a baby with a pacifier, but it's not so cute with a 15-year-old, you know? I mean, if, if that's happening, something's really wrong. Come on, a six-month-old with a diaper, it looks natural. A 20-year-old with a diaper doesn't look so natural. I know there might be some 80-year-olds that wear diapers. But, but anyway, at some point, <laughs> they say when you get old, you revert back to childhood, you know? You used to wear diapers, now you're wearing diapers again. And, uh, and so, you, you know, you used to didn't have any teeth, and now you don't have any teeth. And, and uh, so, I mean, it's, it's full, you know, it, it's full circle. But, uh, but God expects us to grow up, amen? The Bible says, having done all to stand, come on, then stand. Yeah. And sometimes there's periods when you're just standing, amen? Yeah. And you're not seeing a whole lot of excitement. Come on, but you're standing on the Word of God, and you develop the fruit of faithfulness in your life. Now turn over to, to Romans 10, verse 8. And so how do I plant a seed of the Word of God? If I'm going to plant it in my life, I shouldn't teach you on uh, planting seeds in your life without telling you how to plant those seeds. Psalmist David said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. And so he said, I've hid the word. Now, if something is hidden, then you can't see it. Come on, if my Bible is just laying there on the table, it's not hidden. You can see it. Come on, but if I get that Bible and I memorize some scriptures and I put them in my heart and I begin to speak them, come on, it's hidden. Come on, it's hidden in my heart. And so, Romans 10 and verse 8. It says, but what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. And so right before that, it says, you know, don't say, well, Christ, are you going to come down from heaven and save me? And, and you know, and, and or is, is Jesus going to come and do it? But it says the word is there. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But it says the word is in your mouth and it's in your heart. How do you get born again? Come on, you believe in your heart. And you confess Jesus with your mouth. That's how you're born again. But what the point I'm trying to emphasize here is that there is a heart and a mouth connection. Yeah. In other words, the Bible says, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Yes. Come on, what is on the inside will probably eventually come out. Yeah. Unless you're a very wise person. <laughs> but, you know, under pressure, and when you get angry, whatever's in there might slip out. Amen? Amen. Yeah. And so we all know that that's true. But did you know that vice versa is also true? What is in your mouth will get in your heart. Amen. Come on, and something that you say a lot is going to get in your heart. And something that you talk about will get in your heart. That's why if you're trying to overcome unforgiveness, you just stop talking about it. Because the more you talk about it, the bigger mountain it is. Amen? Yeah. And so if you'll stop talking about it, they'll, they'll solve, solve a lot of it right there. Amen? And, uh, but the point is, if you speak the word of God, you're going to get it in your heart. Because what you say is going to get in your heart. And so King David, uh, Psalms 119 describes King David's relationship with the word of God. And sometimes folks want to have a relationship with God without having a relationship with the Bible. Amen. And not really knowing the word or knowing what's in the word. But the Bible is God's written word. Come on, it was put, it was put in, in written form for, for our benefit. So that we can read it and so that we can profit from it. But in Psalms 119, David said he declared the word with his lips. He said that he meditated on the word. Yeah. What's that? That's just thinking about it over and over. Come on, and we all are great meditators. Come on, and you know, and you just meditate on different things. Yeah. Right. Your vacation or food or the football game or, you know, whatever it is, your hunting trip, your fishing trip. Come on, but there's things that, that you think about over and over and you run through your mind. Yeah. Amen? So we're all world champion meditators. The problem is, it's usually not on the Word of God. Come on, but you got to get the Word. you got to take a scripture. you got to take a promise. Come on, and you got to do more than just say it, but you got to think about it. Amen? And then the goal is for it to get in your feet. 
Come on and become an action in your life. Become a habit in your life. David said that he rejoiced at the word like one who had found great spoil. Come on, if you found $100,000 in a, in a briefcase or something like that, I guarantee you, you would rejoice. Come on, one day I was going through my closet and you know, I've got quite a few jackets and suits. And so I was, you know, looking through a jacket, looked in a suit and, and put my hand in the, in the pocket there. And there was like a hundred dollars cash in there. I went, "Woo, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. At some point I put the hundred dollars in there to save it and had forgotten about it. I'm just so glad my wife didn't find it before me. <laughs> Come on, but you rejoice as one who found great spoil. How many know the promises of God are worth more than a hundred dollars in your life? They're worth more than a hundred thousand dollars in your life. Amen. And some folks, they really, you know. If you're talking about money, if there's a seminar about how to get some money, people will be there because they think it's really important. Listen, did you know going to heaven is worth billions and billions of dollars if you think about it? People, they, they, you know, they save up, they invest all their life so they can live for 20 years without working. You know, I heard a story about a, about a hippie and he wasn't working. And so a, a man went up to him and said, uh, man, why don't you get a job? He said, well, why should I get a job? He said, so that when you get old, you won't have to work. And the hippie said, well, I'm not working now. So uh, anyway, my daddy used to tell that joke. But, but people, they'll, they'll save their money so they don't have to work for 20 years. And they, you know, they can enjoy life. But, you know, eternity is forever. Come on, think about what that kind of retirement would cost you. And people think, well, it's not worth it serving God? Are you crazy? God has a retirement plan that's out of this world. Amen. I guarantee you. Amen. Now, maybe some of y'all got that, but I don't know. But, uh, but David rejoiced as one who had found great spoil. Praise God. And so we're going to plant some seed this morning. And the Word has all kinds of seed, but I'm just going to give you an example on how to plant the Word of God in your heart. And so first of all, we're going to plant some righteousness seed. And so righteousness means you're right standing with God. And so obviously you've got to be born again, accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, repent of your sins to be in right standing with God. And then if you mess up after that, the Bible says confess your sins and you're restored to righteousness. Yet, for many Christians, they don't feel right with God even though they've done all those things. And so they don't really under, they don't feel like they have a standing with God or that they're worthy for God to hear their prayer or bless them or help them in any way. Yeah. And so, you know, because of their past or because of their mentality, they never really feel accepted by God. Yeah. And their mentality is that God would bless somebody else, but he's not going to bless me because of my past or, you know, or whatever. And they have that kind of mentality. And so until you know that you're accepted by God, you're never really going to, to you're never really going to approach God and receive the things that you need. And so, understanding your righteousness is important. And so, let's plant some righteousness seed. Romans five seventeen says, "Those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life by Jesus Christ." Amen. Say this: Say, I received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. And I reign in life by Jesus Christ. And so righteousness is a gift. None of us could ever earn our right standing with God. Even if, you know, if we did, if we lived perfectly according to, to man's wisdom or man's standards, it wouldn't be enough. And so it is a gift. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Let's say this, Jesus was made sin for me, and I'm the righteousness of God in him. Jesus, Jesus was made sin for me, and I'm the righteousness of God in him. Not in my own standing, but in him. Ephesians 1, 6, because he hath made us accepted in Christ. Say, I'm accepted in Christ. Amen. And so when, whenever you say that, and when you confess that, Come on, you're putting the Word of God in your heart. You're changing your mind. You're changing your mentality. It'll change the way that you relate to God. And you don't just do this one time and it works. Come on, you've got you to do it over and over. Do it daily. All right. What about those who are struggling with sin? Come on, and the Bible tells us that we have power over sin. 
it's a reality. You say, well, if I have power over sin, why am I struggling with sin? Because you don't really have the word in your heart or, or know the truth in your heart that you can be free and, and overcome. Yeah. And so Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So say this, say, my old man was crucified with Christ. From now on, I will not serve sin. And so you declare that about 10 or 12 times a day. Come on and let it get down in your heart. Romans 6, 11 says, Reckon yourselves to be dead to sin and alive to God. Say, I consider myself dead to sin and alive to God. And so you say that in the face of temptation. And the, come on, in the face of your struggle, you begin to declare the word of God. Romans 6, 14 says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you're not under the law, but under grace. Say, sin, sin shall not have dominion over me. Because I'm not under the law, but under grace. So what's the difference? Grace is the ability of God. Come on, it's the forgiveness of God, but it's the ability of God. Come on, under the law, man didn't have the ability to live above sin, but under grace, God imports his nature and his ability to us so that we don't have to sin. Amen. All right, what about some, some healing seed? So you can come down and, and get prayed for, but your faith makes a difference as to whether you receive or not. And so for most folks, come on, they have to hear the word of God concerning healing, but they have to do more than that. They've got to meditate on it, and they have to confess it and say it so that it gets in their heart. Amen? Amen. And so here's some healing seed. Exodus 15, 26 says, For I am the Lord that healeth thee. So let's say, He is the Lord that heals me. And so you have to make it personal. Come on, if he heals somebody else, he heals you. Yeah. Galatians 3.13 says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Say this, Christ hath redeemed me from the curse of the law. He was made a curse for me. And if you read about the curse of the law in Deuteronomy 28, come on, it was poverty and sickness and defeat, uh, you know, your enemies defeat you and, and all those things. And so if Christ has redeemed you from the curse of the law, he's redeemed you from sickness. Yeah, yeah. All right, Isaiah 53, 5 says, by his stripes we are healed. Yeah, yeah. Say this, by his stripes I am healed. By his stripes I am healed. Amen. And so you continue to say that. Psalms 91, 16 says, with long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Amen. Say, with long life God will satisfy me. Show me his salvation. Come on, you have to declare that because I know, you know, as people get older, if, if they're facing something, you know, that's, uh, you know, that could be terminal, come on, the devil tell them, you know, hey, yeah, you're going to die. And some folks even begin to make plans to die. What do you have to do? Say, with long life, will he satisfy me and show me his salvation? You declare that, amen? Yeah. That I'm going to live a long life. Yeah. Now, all of us will die from old age. Hopefully, you know, at 110 or something like that. But everybody's going to die from old age. And, and so, I mean, that's natural. But you don't have to die prematurely. Come on, you don't have to die before your time. Amen? And you don't have to die of, of sickness like that. All right. Now let's plant some seed for finances. Isaiah 119 says, If you're willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. Say, I'm willing and obedient to God. And I'll eat the good of the land. Amen. I know that that's a, a, a promise that's true. Come on, because I eat the good of the land. And, you know, my brother says, I'm going to live in the best, drive the best, and eat the best. Well, I can't say I live in the best or drive the best, but I do eat the best. Amen? And so it says, if you're willing to obey. In other words, you obey, but you've got to have the right attitude, too. Amen? Some folks give, but they give with the wrong attitude. Or they serve God, but they do it grudgingly. Or, why well, I can't believe i got to do this, you know. And I'm getting tired of this ministry. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, Luke 6, 38. Says, given it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, and running over. Will men give unto you for the same measure you give, it will be given back to you. See, I give generously. I give generously. And I receive generously. I receive generously. God, is God is multiplying what I give. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, 
He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Say, I sow generously and I receive generously. I sow generously. Amen. So you have to declare the word of God so that your faith can be released. And your faith has everything to do with you receiving from God. Amen. And so that's how that's just some examples of how you how you put the word of God in your heart. Come on, you do it with your mind. Yes. And when it's on the inside, it's a seed that, that will produce a harvest in your life. Praise God. Well, stand to your feet. Today we're going to be dismissed in prayer. And uh, Father, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you that you've given us a way to plant your word in our hearts. And Father, I pray, pray, I pray that the word that's planted today yes. will bring forth a great harvest in our lives. And that we'll be good ground and bring forth, bring forth the crop. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 You're